Okay, thanks, sorry I had to, we're recording this presentation, so just a couple of housekeeping things. If you wanna share the presentation or view it afterwards, um, you can sign up in the back. If you put your email address down, please make it legible because I'm the one who has to read it. <laughs> um, so this is actually part of a series. This is the second year the Idaho Trails Association has put it on. We call it the Idaho Trail Master Presentation Series. And once a month, I put on a presentation in kind of the off season, usually like October through April, having to do with anything to help you kind of better enjoy your hiking experience, to learn about some hiking opportunities, how to care for your feet, how to lower your pack weight, things of that nature. If you have a hard time hearing me or Don at any point, please like raise your hand or get our attention. We do have to compete a little bit with that kicking on and off, but I'll try and get as loud as I can. Um, but, but feel free to just let us know if you're having a hard time. And at any point, if you have questions during the presentation, um, this doesn't need to be super formal. You can raise your hand and ask questions as much as you like. With that, we'll get started today. And so Don, I'll have you, um, yeah, that'd be great. I don't have a clicker to change the slides, so I need an assistant. So I'm just gonna start off telling you a little bit about the Idaho Trails Association. How many of you are familiar with Idaho Trails Association? Okay, not everybody, that's awesome. This is exactly why we partner with RI and come here because they do a really great job of bringing people in for these kinds of presentations and it gives us good exposure and we bring things back to them by being here and doing it and getting some of you back out on the trail to help us. So I'll let me click to the next slide. So I'm just gonna start off a little bit talking about um, just kind of talking about trails, trail maintenance, um, and a little bit of specifics to Idaho. So the National Forest System Trail Stewardship Act said that we significantly, significantly need to increase the role of volunteers for trail maintenance. Go ahead. And in that act, they also lined out 15 priority areas. And I know this map is a little bit small, but you can see there are a number of areas in Idaho that are in that top 15. That includes the Hell's Canyon Complex, the Frank Church Wilderness of No Return, and the Milad Larkins Wilderness Area. And I think one of the biggest hurdles we have with trails maintenance in Idaho is Idaho has so much public land. And just like everybody else, where the Forest Service and the other agencies are losing funding for things like trail maintenance, having smaller crews. And so they're typically focusing on trails where they know there's gonna be more use. And a lot of the trails like deep in these wilderness areas are just falling in disrepair. We have a lot of wildfire activity. You have a fire go through an area and if, especially in the Frank Church, there's a lot of lodgepole and that stuff comes down like matchsticks. And it becomes almost impossible to access those trails after a few years if they're not being cleared because it's difficult to stay on the trail when you're just climbing over down trees the whole day. And so, yeah, go ahead. I don't think there's a significance other than to show you that they're different areas. Yeah. Um, so let's go on to the next slide, please. All right, so, so here's a couple of more pieces that have come out of the news in the last year or so. Um, in that same act, they're saying that they would like to double the amount of work that contractors and volunteers are doing. But interestingly enough, that doesn't come with any funding. So that's why we rely on our volunteer base, not only for their work, but also for their donation dollars. And we want, they're now saying that the volunteer groups that are going out there who used to just help kind of augment the work that they were going, doing are now deemed critical. Go ahead. Um, on the positive side, in 2018, the Omnibus Appropriation Bill did cut what they used to call fire borrowing. So in big wildfire years, um, the Forest Service would take money out of trail maintenance and other, other groups' fundings and put it towards fire, um, fire events. And so even less money was going to trail maintenance. 
and again needing to have um, more tr regular trail maintenance done by the volunteers and with all of this less money they just knew that you know these trails are going to fall more and more into disrepair over time okay go ahead so just to talk a little bit about the status of trails in idaho this information is coming from a report that was put out by the university of idaho if you're interested in reading more there is a link on the next page so in idaho there's about 10,000 miles of non-motorized trails in public lands um, the stimulus bill did increase funding a little bit, uh, but we do know that 30% of our non-motorized trails are not meeting national quality standards. In 2016, we had almost 66,000 volunteer hours going towards tra trail maintenance at a value of about $1.5 million. Over 50% of the maintenance was done by organizations like Idaho Trails Association, the Soe Bitterup Foundation, um, Idaho Youth Conservation Corps, and other contractors. And so over 50% of the work, I mean, that's pretty huge when you're having volunteers out there doing 50% of the trail maintenance going on in the state. Yeah, go ahead. Only 30% meet national quality standards. And so the Forest Service and probably the BLM as well, they have a whole you know, pamphlet on what those standards are with and what's cleared and trail bed tread status. You know, and, so, um, and that's just the, the um, non-motorized trails. So, and we also know that the, the motorized trails, they're a little bit easier to take care of, and especially outside of the wilderness areas, right? Because you can take motorcycles on them, you can use chainsaws. Can't do that in the wilderness areas. Go ahead. Crosscut saws. Cross cross yep. Yeah. Yep, all of them. Yeah. So it does say, without additional funding for maintenance through existing or new dedicated sources, non-motorized trail opportunities on Idaho's National Forest are likely to decline. They are not likely to decline. They are going to decline. Go ahead. All right, so talked a little bit about Idaho Trails Association. We were formed in 2010 to promote the continued enjoyment of Idaho's hiking trails. We want all of you to be out there enjoying them, but we also want you all to come and help us. Um, we try to put on stewardship events like this, uh, where we're also educating you on how to respectfully enjoy our trails. We believe in tradition. Um, we use all traditional trail maintenance tools. We don't use any chainsaws, uh, crosscut saws only. And we've had a lot of people ask us why we do that. And it's for a number of reasons. Um, one, safety. You have to be certified, a certified Sawyer to run a chainsaw on a volunteer group trip for the Forest Service. Um, two, I don't want to listen to a chainsaw all day. <laughs> Because the other part of being out there, it really is kind of like a bonding experience. And when you're out there with a chainsaw running all day, people aren't talking to each other because it's noisy. And it really is a great way to get to know the people that you're out there with. I honestly have made some of the best friends I have just like on those trips because you're spending so much quality time together. And, it's a, and we kind of want to keep those traditional skills alive because just like uh, all, some other traditions, they're falling by the wayside. Our executive director, Jeff Halligan, um, is one of the few people who actually knows how to tune a crosscut saw. And yet they do call that and it takes special skills. And not just anybody can go at it with a file and, and make a crosscut saw run really well. Um, we're hoping to keep expanding our education side um, by doing things like this and also next year we are doing our inaugural youth program trip out of the Sun Valley area. This is super exciting for us. We've been wanting to do a youth program for a while because we all know that our, our kids need to be spending more time outside and learning how to appreciate it and learning how to work hard. Um, and we, we do some uh, advocacy for preservation and protection of our wilderness areas and trails as well. So to give you an idea how much we've grown, we've grown tenfold since our beginnings. 
um, which is huge for us. And I definitely give, again, a lot of credit to our executive director, Jeff Halligan. He's been super awesome at um, increasing the amount of projects we're doing, getting more people, having more boots on the ground doing work. Okay. And obviously, with the, the increase in the number of people, there's also an increase in monetary value. And the significance of this is we can use those hours as um, a lot of times, like if we're applying for grants and things, as kind of a cost sharing measure. So if we can show that we're gonna be sending X amount of people out doing X amount of work, we may be able to get some sort of a match from the Forest Service or some other granting entity. So it is important that we increase our hours and our donations, okay? So just to even give you an example of how we grow, we've grown even over the last year, um, everything is up. Um, we have primarily focused on some larger projects, the week-long projects, but we're really trying hard to have a broader portfolio of trips, including like long weekends or weekends. Um, also some one day projects, if you wanna like bring kids out or something like that, we have some projects that are conducive to family uh, events. And just this last year, I started doing ladies only trail maintenance trips. So if you're interested in doing trail maintenance and you're a lady and you don't wanna be scrutinized by the man side, <laughs> um, please come, it's, you know, I just, I got into this and I, I was really nervous about it because I'd never run a cross cut or used a Pulaski and, uh-oh. Oh. oh, okay, that's okay, we'll restart it. That's okay. Um, and, and we'll res, um, let me back. <laughs> Lost my train of thought. Um, please come out and sign up for one of the ladies only projects. It's a lot of fun. It's a place where you can learn and not feel like you need to be all macho and any of you here can use the tools. And uh, it's really fun to kind of just get together with the ladies sometimes. Okay. All right, so how can you help? Number one, become a member. And you can do that by visiting our website at any time, idahotrailsassociation.org. Sign up for a trail project. Uh, we will probably be putting out this year's trail project list end of March, first part of April sometime. And if you give me your email address, you will get an email telling you when the project list is up. And one of the perks of being a member is you get to sign up for projects a whole month before anybody else, the general public. And this is good if you wanting to get into like the sawtooth trips or the white cloud trips, or maybe into Hell's Canyon, some of our like more high profile trips. Um, again, we have family friendly single day overnights and the week long vacation trips. The vacation trips means that there's usually a pack string involved that will be bringing in your tools, some of your gear and your food usually a cook, a camp cook is in there and cooking all of your meals for you. So it is actually quite luxurious for a volunteer trip. <coughs> Excuse me. Also just be an advocate, be an advocate for our trails. And when you're, when you're out there, be conscientious of how you're using our trails. You know, even here locally, this is a really hard time to be hiking on the Ridge to Rivers trails. If it's muddy, don't be out there. That is you advocating. If you see somebody going on the trails or money, shame them. That is you advocating. I'm not even joking. <laughs> Keep people off of the trails. It's super hard on them and there's just more and more people in town and so we have to respect those places. And if you have any other ideas of how you can help us better our mission, we are open to ideas. We're always looking for people to just kind of help with some of the basics, help getting ready for trips, you know, reorganizing gear and, and cooking supplies, things of that nature. So um, come and talk to me if you're interested in being involved and we'll put you to work, yeah. Are any of the trail projects uh, something an Eagle Scout uh, candidate could do and sign up for? Sure, yeah. Um, yes, how old is an Eagle Scout? Well, what I'm thinking of is 14 years old. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, and I would say um, if there were, It'd be a group of scouts, 
OK, sure. So you might want to do a trip that was with the scouts for like a weekend or something like that. OK, yeah. Well, if that's something you're interested in, come and talk to me afterwards. We'll swap some contact information and start a conversation. But yeah, I think, I think we could do something like that. OK. All right, so now I am going to turn it over to our featured speaker, if nobody has any questions about the Idaho Trails Association. No questions? OK. Sorry, excuse me. I'm pulling up my notes real quick. All right, so Dr. Donna Owen received her biology degree from UC Irvine and attended podiatry school in San Francisco. She has been in private podiatry practice in Boise for 22 years, is a former competitive swimmer, ultra runner, and triathlete, and now a recreational mountain biker, hiker, swimmer, and underpaid cook and housekeeper to her two <laughs> teenagers and husband. <laughs> She enjoys working with athletes and active individuals, prefers to take a conservative approach to care of her patients, and attempts to keep people as active as possible. Welcome, Donna. We're going to do just a quick mic swap here. All right, I'm pretty informal, which I guess you'll probably pick up on here. Um, I kind of like to know who I'm speaking to in a way. Like, should I just assume you all hike, right? Yeah. Okay, right, and you're all pretty active people, maybe runners, mountain bikers, yeah, okay. Um, this is my trip from this past summer. Does anyone know where that is? Can you tell? No? It is. So the lake would be your clue. It's a heart-shaped lake. So anyway, I'd never been to the Bighorn Crags before. That's where I went. Um, so that's Heart Lake. And it was a fantastic trip. So anyway, um, we can move on. <laughs> uh, OK, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is a little bit directed by Pam. She had some things that maybe you know, I should cover, and then some of it is directed by me. When I go on a trip, these are the things I think, okay, gosh, I better make sure I have these ducks in a row, because I, the worst thing is you're eight miles in somewhere, and I don't know, something hurts, and you're like, I don't know what that is, and you don't want it to hurt, right? You just want to enjoy your trip. So um, things that I think are pretty important are shoes. Um, sometimes we need to add something to our shoes if we're not comfortable in our shoes, which can happen. Um, so I'll talk to you about orthotics. What are they? What kinds there are? And who would need them? Um, socks I threw in there. I mean, I think we all know what socks we need, but I, I'll talk about them a little bit. And then, you know, prepare is pretty generic. Um, I will cover just some things that I, I Again, I probably kind of think about before I leave on my trip and things that maybe I deal with while I'm on my trip. And hopefully you don't want to deal with a lot of those things on your trip on the prepare side of things. Um, so you can hit the next one. Okay, so right, people say, well, God, what shoe do I wear? Right? Well, you want to wear the shoe that's comfortable for you. Well, of course, um, not everyone will have the same shoe, right? And some people need the glass slipper, and it's hard to find. And so if you're someone who's here because you're hoping I'm going to tell you what shoe to buy, I'm, I'm not, okay? But I'm going to help you maybe figure that out. Like, what's going to work for you for certain things, okay? Because that matters, too, what we're doing. So um, we can go to the next one. So I think in order to talk about shoes, just I think you need to know what um, – a shoe is made out of because I'm going to refer to some of these things possibly, right? So the outer sole is right everything that touches the ground. Um, sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, your midsole is 
<clears throat> the part of the shoe that the outer sole is attached to and the upper is sewn onto. So not so important in a dress shoe, but in an athletic shoe, it, it can matter, okay? So I'll talk to you about that. Um, the upper sometimes can matter. Uh, and then obviously the inner sole, there's different guts in every shoe and a lot of shoes don't have any guts at all. So um, that can matter and that maybe is that lead into those, do we need insoles or orthotics? Okay, um, so we can go to the next one. Okay, so we are not created equal. I was taught we were created equal, but as a podiatrist, I know we are not created equal. So when people say, okay, tell me what shoe I need to wear because I'm going on this epic hiking trip. Well, on the soccer field, if you come up and ask me that, I can't give you the answer, okay? Um, if, you, if you have average foot shapes, you will fit into average shoes and be perfectly fine. And you probably won't even come up to me and ask me, what shoe should I wear for this trip? So if you're trying to find a shoe that's comfortable, it could be that you don't have an average foot shape. Okay, and I, I don't know if I want to get into this too much, but um, right, do you guys understand there are feet that maybe have a higher arch? Some of them are really rigid and stiff. Uh, some feet are pancake feet that are super, super flat. They'll fit into most things, but they're wide because you step on them and then they get fat. Um, the shape of the foot can matter and how, the, how much that foot moves can matter, okay? So uh, the most difficult foot, I think, is, I call it the Cinderella foot because it wants the glass slipper. It's that high arch foot that's very rigid. Um, you know, you can't get it into an alpine boot because you just about kill yourself to jam it in there. There are no shoes that fit you. Um, you guys are gonna have a harder time. You are not gonna get the answer from me tonight probably right so um those are the people i see in my office and i'm not trying to drum up business but that just ha happens so um okay we can go to the next one okay so right so say we we find our shoes well gosh should i back up to shoes let me talk to you about shoes um you know in the old days when we went hiking we had leather boots and it they're all the same right so now we have sometimes we'll do a shorter hike and we don't even want to wear our hiking boots we just want to wear our tiny runners right our running shoes or our walking shoes so there have been some developments over the last 10 years in running shoes so um you know nike made the first running shoe in the 70s and he did it with a waffle iron right bill bowerman just put some stuff in a waffle iron and that was your very first athletic shoe and it was technically what's called a zero drop shoe okay we didn't stay in zero drop shoes for very long we developed athletic shoes hiking boots and running shoes to have what's called a 10 millimeter drop from your heel to your toe so do you guys know what that means right so traditional running shoes are 10 millimeters from heel to toe and that's how much higher your heel is to your forefoot. There are some great benefits of having that. So if we bring the ground up to our foot with that thicker heel, your foot goes through a little bit less range of motion than if you are in a zero drop shoe or if you're barefoot, okay? So if you're having issues, sometimes your shoes can matter, all right? So we now have zero drop shoes, Right, and then way back in the 60s, someone made earth shoes. Do you guys remember earth shoes? It's a negative heel. The heel's lower than your forefoot. Um, that, it's just a funky way to walk, so you wouldn't run a marathon in that. Um, but it can be helpful and it can be comfortable for certain scenarios. So we have negative heel shoes, we have zero drop shoes, we have traditional heel height shoes, and then we have Shoes that are soft and we have shoes that are rigid, right? So you guys know what I mean by a ri rigid shoe? I feel like I should maybe, okay, we won't take my shoe. Here's a shoe, okay, perfect. Okay, so when I talk to people about a rigid shoe, I'm talking about a shoe that doesn't twist or bend through the middle of that shoe, through the midsole, okay? 
So midsoles for running shoes are made out of ethyl vinyl acetate, acetate, EVA. They tend to be of varying densities of material. We have moved into this generation of going softer, right? So uh, the Tarahumar Indians, right? We wrote a book about them in 2009, Born to Run, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, I need to be a barefoot runner. So that's when we started dropping the hill to zero drop shoe. That's when we came out with five fingers and started running barefoot. And then everyone got hurt or most people got hurt. Um, <clears throat> now we know we actually need shoes. We don't run in the five fingers so much anymore. I mean, some people do. Um, but we still kept with that trend to lower that heel from a 10 millimeter heel. Now a lot of shoemakers will also make a four to six millimeter heel drop shoe so it's kind of in the middle and they've made them soft right and so when people say god my feet are just killing me and i keep getting softer and softer shoes and then they come in and see me and they say can you make me a pillow for my feet so i can run and i no but hoka can hoka made a pillow right so that's another shoe they made a really thick eva midsole shoe that's I, don't, I think it's like a, on average an, an inch thicker from heel to toe, but it's technically a zero drop shoe on a giant pillow. So that is good for running long distances. That's what it was made for. It was for endurance runners. Um, you know, there's different styles of running. I'm kind of deviating, but there's different styles of running. So Hoka's were made for ultra runners who have that ultra run shuffle. I, do you guys know what, what I'm talking about? Okay, so fast runners will heel strike and stride out, right? Uh, very, very fast runners don't even heel strike, they're on their toes. So their foot is stable throughout their gait cycle. So ultra runners, oh gosh, we could run a whole lot longer if we kind of do this slog through where we weight bear on our midfoot to forefoot we don't heel strike so our, our stride is short and i'm talking the average person not the guy who wins okay so it's different <laughs> okay so that's what hokas were made for and then they became trendy and now everyone's in hokas so um, they're good for some things but if you have pain with your hokas there's a reason for it and it's because you're striding out and your foot is probably going through too much range of motion so okay so there's a shoe talk so Say you, you found your shoe, you think that's the shoe and you love the shoe and, and now your feet still hurt you. So that's when we start to add better guts into the shoe, okay? So the reason why feet hurt usually in their shoes, it's all mechanics, right? So it's how your feet work. And that's why it matters what shape your foot is in, or not, not like how fit you are, but the shape of your foot and how that foot moves, that's how that matters. So. Um, again, average people have a lot of choices. They have over-the-counter products readily available for them. And if you want to try something, you should try something before you go and run to a doctor and pay money, okay? So um, over-the-counter means they're pre-made. Prescription means they're made to a, um, a form of your foot, okay? Those can be soft orthotics and they can be hard orthotics. In general, for a podiatrist, when we see a soft orthotic, we call that an accommodative orthotic. When we see a rigid hard orthotic, we call it a functional orthotic. And you're gonna say, well, what the hell does that mean? So accommodative means it's nice and soft and we accommodate for all your deformities and we don't even worry about stabilizing your foot. We're just giving you a squishy thing to stand on. So it is really good for walking through your house to go brush your teeth and go to the bathroom and then sit down and read. It is not super good to go and walk 10 miles, right? It's just too squishy. It just doesn't really stabilize our skeleton. It's just, it's a pillow. Well, I guess it kind of lied. I could make a pillow for you. That's, it, you could buy a pillow. You wouldn't want to waste money on me making a pillow. So um, the length of device, Right, some people will call these full length. Um, most people know of orthotics as full length. Uh, three quarters means that device goes just behind your metatarsal heads, right? Does everyone know what metatarsals are? That's the ball of your foot. I did bring a skeleton just in case. 
Okay, so, <clears throat> all right, these are your metatarsal heads, your long bones in your foot. So three quarters means that device ends here, okay? Full length goes to your toes. Does it matter? Depends. Depends on what we're trying to do, okay? So functional devices typically are three quarters, and then they can have something soft on top. The only reason why I put something soft on top is if I need to add an accommodative pad or something to the toe. So they take up space in shoes. So they kind of suck to have them full length, if you ask me. Um, padding is an accommodative form of taking pressure off an area. The common mistake people make with padding is if they have an owie spot, they want to put the pad right on the sore spot. Well, when you do that, you are increasing the pressure on your sore spot, so you're gonna get sore sooner. So do you guys understand that, right? So if you're, you're sore at your bunion, don't put the pad on your bunion. You have to put it behind it or in front of it. So around that area d takes that pressure, okay? So, and I'll, I can talk about pads a little bit later, but um, okay, we can move on. Um, okay, so over-the-counter support. Um, Over-the-counter support is not created equal either, right? So material can matter. I feel like it's a waste of money to buy anything super soft. And gel doesn't do much for you other than you think you're doing something for yourself. That's your pillow. Um, it's supposed to take pressure off, but remember, if you're getting pressure you're, and you put a pad under it, you're getting pressure sooner, so that usually doesn't do much for you. So you could buy Dr. Scholl's things, but don't expect a whole lot out of them. When I have someone who walks up to me and says, okay, what should I buy? Because I just want to try something first before I come see you. I actually usually say, go buy yourself some super feet because they're $50. And they're plastic, which means they're durable. They are full length, but you can buy super feet that is three quarters. So if you need more space for your toes, it'll fit in your shoes. And so this is more for women, right? We have a lot of shoes we want to wear. We can't put this big thing in every shoe. So these are for athletic shoes for girls and boys, but not really for anything else for girls, right? It's just not going to fit. Um, soles are another one. Soles have a really, really high medial arch. So midline is here. Medial means the inside of your arch. Lateral is the outside. Okay, so most, if not all, over-the-counter orthotics only give you medial arch support. Okay, if you look at a foot, <clears throat> we have a lot of joints in the middle. This is the equivalent of our wrist. Okay, it's meant to move so that when you land, it absorbs impact, right? You, all your muscles that are in your leg below your knee are what control your foot. So we sometimes forget that when we put arch support underneath us and we put it, we jam a whole bunch of stuff under that medial arch and people go, God, that's just, it just kills me. Well, it's because we probably don't need it all there. Sometimes we need it on the outside and that's, if you're having trouble with over-the-counter orthotics, it might be because you need lateral support underneath your foot and you can't buy it, um, not in an insole, okay? So that's when you have to get it added or have it made for you. So that's why I was like, see your podiatrist, right? I could give you guidance on, okay, you know, try this, try that, um, based on just your foot shape and how it moves. Okay, so we can go to that next one. Um, right, so I kind of talked about, or, or, Accommodative orthotics. I make accommodative orthotics on occasion, but I, I see active people, um, even my sedentary people. I want them to be active, so I don't really make too many of these soft things. Um, these are made from a weight bearing position of your foot. So chiropractors make these, physical therapists, orthotists, um, they will all make these based on just you know, you stand into a foam box and then they capture your foot in its deformed position. It doesn't do much to stabilize your foot. Um, ski orthotics can be made this way um, and still have some benefit because they're basically bringing 
that boot up to your foot and filling up space so that when you go ahead and, and lean into that edge of your ski, you can turn, okay? So if you have that kind of a insole in your ski boot and your feet still hurt you, it's because it's not stabilizing your midfoot, okay? So then you move to functional orthotic in your ski boot. Um, okay, so that next one. So functional um, orthotics, these do stabilize your skeleton. They make your, they don't lock up your foot, but they make your skeleton more stable. <clears throat> so the workload for your uh, muscles isn't as significant. They do tend to be more rigid. I can make them soft, but then they're gonna die <laughs> very quickly. So I try to make them of, out of plastic, tends to be the most durable. Um, graphite can be made, they're thinner, they're lighter, but they tend to break, they fracture pretty quickly, so I actually don't make graphite unless you're about 100 pounds, and, and there's very few people who are around 100 pounds. So I mostly make plastic. Um, podiatrists really are the only people who make functional orthotics. So you have to be measured and then casted in a non-weight-bearing position for a functional orthotic, okay? So it's not blind, although some make them blind, where they just have their assistant cast you and then they give you something um, and then the newer versions are the, there is a, a way to scan a foot with an iPad and then they mail them in. Um, I haven't moved to that because I cannot, they for some reason cannot translate my scan into a real model of the foot so I can put the prescription on it. So then I think you're getting an over-the-counter orthotic if you do that. So. That doesn't make sense to me, and you don't want to certainly pay me all that money and get in over-the-counter orthotics. So um, functional orthotics are really what I make, and that's probably what you guys would want if over-the-counters don't work for you. Um, I still do modify over-the-counter orthotics, though, too, because they're cheaper. So I, I work with both. Okay, so the next one. Um, okay, so padding. Uh, I don't use padding all that much because for, right, for active people, right, we want to get dressed in the morning and we want to just jam our feet in our shoes and we want to go, right? So when I, padding can be easy to keep toes separated and keep pressure off lumps and bumps and deformities. But I mean, do you really want to put your underwear on and then put pads on your feet and then your socks on and then go in your shoes? And it's probably, maybe, I don't. So the only time we use padding is kind of in a pinch or in case we have to supplement a functional orthotic, okay? So uh, the most common padding probably that I use is a metatarsal pad and that's when I functionally stabilize someone in a functional orthotic and then they have really long toes and they toe off their device, I use that pad to carry a little bit more pressure further, okay? Or in our fancy dress shoes when we have to look cute and we still have metatarsal pressure, I put a metatarsal pad on those, which maybe is not for guys, more for girls. Okay, so, um, oh, do you guys know what moleskin is, right? Moleskin isn't really padding, it's to absorb friction. Okay, so there's a place for that for backpacking, and I'll go over that, so we can go to the next one. Um, okay, socks. Do you guys wear cotton socks anymore? Okay. Because you all know, right, it just holds moisture on your skin. And it stays wet for a really long time. So cotton feels really good elsewhere. But if you're going to go on a big, long hiking trip, I probably would tell you not to wear cotton, OK? So synthetic socks are really pretty good. They wick moisture away from your skin. And that's the same with wool. I do not think thickness of sock matters. So wear what you feel is comfortable. Right, um, compression can feel good, especially if you're gonna do a really long trip. So um, just know when you injure something and it swells, swelling is what hurts you. So if you sprain your ankle and then you put compression on it, you probably can keep going because you're controlling the swelling so it doesn't hurt you, okay? So there are some socks that put that really tight band around the middle of that foot and it feels good right so those are nice too so um but wear what you want um okay so the next one uh okay so these are probably more maybe what you want to hear um 
right? So these are the things I think are common, right? Or skin injuries, maybe bug bites. I'm not gonna deal with mammals and reptile bites. Um, blisters, toenail problems, heel pain, leg and knee pain. So um, you can go to the next one. So when we're talking about anything that you injure, your skin is very strong, it's your armor, okay? But if you injure it, you will heal quicker if you cover it, okay? You don't have to go super clean, right? Because when we're backpacking, I mean, are you really gonna pack this giant first aid kit? You know, don't if you do, right? <laughs> Don't bring your beer instead or something. Um, all you need is a cover, okay? So it just keeps dirt out and it keeps it from getting a scab on it, which a scab is not healing, okay? So I put duct tape on there because it's very handy, not only for plumbing repairs, but for your skin, right? Because our skin, we're getting a lot of friction on it. Um, you know, I would just suggest if you are going to use duct tape, get your chapstick and put it on your cut or your wound and then put the duct tape on it so that when you pull your duct tape off, you don't like just like open up your wound and, you know. So you can use a Band-Aid, but God, have you ever tried putting a Band-Aid like on your heel and then you walk and then you're like, where the hell did my Band-Aid go? Well, to, you know, in your sock somewhere, right? It just isn't sticky enough. So you could put ointment on a Band-Aid and then something stickier on top. It holds it a little bit better, right? Right? It's friction. So, and I'm talking probably more blisters, right? So um, you can go to that next one. Um, people always ask me, well, oh, oh, I'm doing bug bites, right? We just want to take care of our symptoms when we get bit by a bug, right? So you don't scratch it into a wound. I put that on there, let's get that. Okay. Um, okay, so when we have a blister, what that is is it's friction on your skin that causes separation, okay? And it fills up with serous fluid, sometimes with blood. Pop them, right? Don't leave them. It will take a week for that fluid to resorb. You're out on the trail. Pop them. If it's just like the day hike, where you're like, I'm just gonna run my dogs for you know the hour and come back and you get a blister, right? You're not gonna stop and try to pop it. You're just gonna get home and then pop it. But if you're out on the trail, I think you know when you can stop and pop it, you pop it because it's filling up with fluid and it's just gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then you're gonna be tortured. So the sooner you can pop it, the better. Um, you want to put enough holes in that thing so it doesn't keep filling up with fluid. Okay, and then you want to compress it. Well, um, you don't want to bring, again, a big kit with you. I, I usually just bring a needle and I bring fingernail clippers, right? And I just chunk holes in it if I get one or, I, mean, you, I usually don't get them. It's someone else in my, with me who's like, hey, I got a blister, right? <laughs> so I just punch a couple holes on it, I compress it, ointment, band-aid, and duct tape, and then off they go. You could do it wherever you want where it doesn't hurt, right? So, right, remember, it's separated from your skin. It doesn't have sensation when it's lifted up. Clip it wherever, and, and then leave the roof on, and then cover it, okay? Uh, yeah? So, my most recent blister was big. Popped it, and then my friend covered it, but left, like, it cut bald skin in the shape of a donut. So the actual blister was left open, but it was padded around it. I would just cover it. Cover the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah it's There's probably no better. Need for it to yeah, to go fancy. Okay. No, and right if you're out on the trail, you, you don't. It's a it's a superficial wound underneath that outer layer, so you want to cover it. Okay. Yeah, until you're you're ready to be home home. Um. Right, so and then I go, okay, we'll fix the cause, right? So you have friction somewhere. Easier said than done if you're on a backpacking trip. So I'm hoping you guys do some like hiking before you go anywhere long, right? So figure out why you're getting blisters. Friction is our problem. If you are getting a lot of range of motion in your foot, you probably need to add an arch support in your shoe, right? So you go get your super feet, you try your super feet or your, I didn't talk about soles, so soles just have a bigger arch and you put them in the oven, you stand on them. 
You don't have to put them in the oven. You can just stand on them. Um, figure those things out before you go, right? Okay, so if, if you're still getting blisters when you're doing all your training hikes, you have too much range of motion of your feet in your shoes. So is it because your shoes are too squishy or do you need better guts in your shoes? Okay, so you want to address those things before you go. Okay, so next one. What's that? Yeah. Oh. No, 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 I know, right? You're like, oh my God, I'm going on a hike. So you put moleskin everywhere and you look like a leopard and then you put your sock on? <laughs> moleskin is for before the blister. Okay, so moleskin is to prevent the blister, right? I have my shoes, I have my orthotics. I still kind of get blisters, right? The, then you go, you stick the moleskin on there, okay? Because that will absorb the friction for you. That's what that's made for. So the Compede, you know, second skin, that doesn't absorb friction very well. It's kind of tacky. So you can experiment with it, though, and see, right? But that's what moleskin is for. It's, it's before the blister, not after. Duct tape's for after, with your Band-Aid in your tape, right? In your <laughs> Okay, so, you know, toenails, ah, oh, God, right? Ah, my toenail's black and blue and it's killing me. You know, well, right, it's jamming and hitting the tip of your boot. Or if you don't have adequate support in your shoes, you're actually doing this with your toes every step. And the reason why you're doing that is because your midfoot isn't supported and you're using the flexors to your toes to help hold your arch up. Okay, so if you're that chronic, oh my gosh, I always get these blisters on my, you know, second, third, and fourth toes. Well, it's, that's why. It's not because your shoes are too tight. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so. Is it on the. Inside between, meaning between your first and second toe? Okay. Well, so this. If your foot pronates in your shoe or goes through lots of range of motion, you are going to get, all right, your foot is going, to, we have gravity on earth. So unfortunately, we're going to keep pressing on the ground until our midfoot and our rear foot stable. For people probably like you, what's happening is this big toe joint's jamming, and as you go and toe off, because you no longer have range of motion there because it's jamming, that skin is pushing over your nail. And so we can keep chasing our tail and keep making that nail thinner. It sounds funny. Okay, you have an ingrown toenail. Well, let's put you in an orthotic. Well, that's weird, but sometimes that is the reason, right? It's just pressure on your big toe. So sometimes it's big toe pressing against second toe, right, with that bunion. And for most people, I, they would rather have me fix their ingrown toenail because I can just fix it and take away that hard nail. So now their skin pressure and there's nothing pressing on it and they're fine. Others, they ha have an orthotic need for other reasons. And sometimes I do that first and then I never have to fix their ingrown toenail. Right, so it just depends, right? So, but if you have a bruise under your nail, it's a blister under your nail, okay? That's all that is. So remember everyone tells you, oh, you got to, in the campfire, heat that needle up and then drill a hole through your toe and everyone's drinking and laughing and you don't trust anyone there to do it, right? So you don't need anyone to drill a hole through your nail. Right? Remember that nail is popped up off that skin. Just pop it from the right underneath your nail. Okay? You just go right underneath it and press it and then put tape on it and you're good. Okay? And then it's going to feel better because you got rid of the fluid. Yep. Right. You just poked it right underneath. Yes. Yes. Right? So after you're like, ugh. Right? Well, I mean, when you're hiking, you. Yep. So pop them. 
right? It's the same as a blister. Yep. You just kind of get your clipper and clip them. Pressure on skin creates callus. If you have callus that also has friction on it, you'll get those hardcore types of calluses that feel like you're standing on a rock, right? So now we're dealing with mm -hmm, pressure and friction. So if they're on the tips of your toes, you're doing this too every time you walk. Right? You're not to the point where you got bloody toes, but you definitely are getting that pressure. So um, you got to experiment with putting more support underneath you because it's your flexors helping to hold your arch up. So posterior tibial muscle is behind, posterior is behind, anterior is in front. That is the muscle that holds the middle of your midfoot stable so that we can get up on our toes. Okay. The muscle that pulls your toes down lies right next to that. It will start to help. And so you might not be in posterior tibial dysfunction or with shin splints, but you're probably using other muscles to help stabilize your foot. And so you end up with those toe things. So probably, which sounds, you guys probably think orthotics are like the magic of like, they can help for a lot of things. And, and most problems are mechanics, right? It's a, our, we have instability. So um, that, that is kind of the reason for a lot of problems. <clears throat> okay, so, oh, God, what do you do if that nail falls off? Uh, it's probably better to not have it on there if you're out and about, right? If it's just in the, you know, say, I don't know, for some reason you're coming home and you can leave it on, leave it on. Right, but you could duct tape it on. But honestly, it, it, if it's moving, it's going to abrade your nail bed and it's going to hurt like a crazy thing. I would pull them off if, if they're that loose. Right, it, you know, to the point where it's falling off on its own. Pull it off, right? But if it's really kind of stuck there, then tape it on so it doesn't move. Okay, I'll get you through. Okay, which is why I'm always like, ah, duct tape's sticky enough. Right, there's not too many Band-Aids that are sticky enough. Okay, so, um, okay, so I don't remember what's next. What do we got? Oh gosh, heel pain. This will open up a whole, like, <sighs> deal with this one before you guys go, okay? Plantar fasciitis, I'm just going to tell you real quickly, is definitely a problem with your foot not stable. It's not stable. So your fascia is not a ligament, it's not a tendon, it's like mailing tape. It's attached on your heel and it spans the whole bottom of your foot to your toes, right? I said we have gravity on earth. We're going to stand down and your foot is meant to collapse. Depending on how much it moves will dictate whether you have strain on your fascia, okay? The more it pulls, it becomes an inflammatory process. Now you have heel pain, right? Everything you did the day before is the reason why it hurts so bad in the morning. The reason why stretching is in the recipe to make it go away is because if your foot's unstable, those muscles are working harder to stabilize your foot. The tighter they get, there's less ability to dorsiflex your foot because those muscles are tight. There's more plantar pressure. So now you're in a vicious circle, right? We can take care of your symptoms or we can take care of your problem. When you guys, when people see me for this, I don't really take care of your symptoms very well which maybe is, you know, might not suit everyone, but I'd rather fix the problem and I don't cover your symptoms because I want to know what I give you works for you. So it's usually I have to stabilize your foot in some fashion, whether it's over the counter or prescription orthotic or whatever. Okay, so if you have heel pain before you leave on your trip, it's not going to kill you. You're just going to hurt, right? You can uh, hike with heel pain. It's not a big deal. But if you stretch through your day, it'll feel a little bit better, right? And then try to add support. So um, anti-inflammatories don't work really well, but you know. Um, anyway, yeah. Your calves, your muscles, which, right? Now you're only stretching your posterior muscle groups, but there's other muscles in your legs that stabilize your foot. So sometimes manual massage works better than just stretching, okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
once you support your foot. So inflammatory processes in our body physiologically are there about three to six weeks, which is why when, you know, you hurt yourself, we go, oh, honey, you'll be fine. Just give it three to six weeks. Your inflammation is going to calm down, right? You're not going to re-aggravate your injury. It's going to go away. Plantar fasciitis is the same. However, we have to walk to the bathroom. We have to walk to get something to eat. We have to walk to work. We, you know, we have to stand. And so if you don't support your foot during all those everyday activities, you are constantly re-aggravating, which is why you'll hear people say, I've had plantar fasciitis for 25 years. <laughs> right? You're like, well, gah, why? why? Right? Well, it's because they just have regular aggravating issues, episodes, and so it just lingers. So in the old days, you're too young, right? I'm too young. In the old days when you had plantar fasciitis, we casted you for six weeks and didn't let you walk, right? Because there's our window, three to six weeks, inflammation's going to go away, but then you had muscle atrophy and joint stiffness, so we don't do that anymore. Well, gosh, no one should be doing that anymore. I don't know, maybe some people do. Okay, so, um, Deal with that before you go, or just don't complain about it while you're out there. <laughs> okay. All right, so next one. Um, so there's different kinds of heel pain, right? So Achilles tendonitis uh, is your posterior heel. That is from your big gastroc and soleal complex muscles that form your Achilles. People who have chronic Achilles tendonitis again, you usually have a foot that's unstable. And it's, it, that muscle will over-contract with all those other stabilizing muscles in your foot, and then it will become a chronic Achilles issue. So, um, you know, treatment for that classically is a heel lift, physical therapy, and rest. But again, most of the time, you know, for athletes, my athletes that are, you know, the soccer players, the runners, the tennis players, I just put them in an orthotic and they go through that physiologic reduction of three to six weeks and they're good, right? So you'll wanna probably stabilize your foot for Achilles tendonitis too, so. Okay, so we can go on. <clears throat> Can't hear me. Okay, oh, sorry, I did that one. Let's go to the other one. Oh gosh, so leg and knee pain, right? If something's funky, right, and hurting you, a lot of it, again, comes down to mechanics. So, we walk differently when we have a pack on. We walk differently when we have a dog on, um, right? There's just things that can change the way we walk. And a lot of our issues do come down to mechanics. So if we're big time standing, walking, running people, posterior, right? So our back, butt cheeks, hamstrings, calves, those are the muscles that get tight when we are doing those things. Things start to get hurt when we have an imbalance between anterior and posterior, right? So if you've ever had a back injury and you go to the physical therapist, they give you stretches for your back and strength for your ab. We're trying to get things back to symmetry. So same thing with knee. It's usually hamstrings are tight and your quads are weak. And it's super common with people who run or hike a lot or stand. So, you know, a lot of this stuff, it just... This is, you know, maybe some physical therapy or, you know, instead of running every day, take one of your runs out of your day and go do yoga, right? It, it actually can help you to gain some flexibility and strength, get everything back to equal, right? So, um, I think, is that it? Do I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Make sure it is a neuroma, for one, right? So there's a lot of confusion between metatarsal pressure and intermetatarsal neuroma, right? So if you have pain in your area of neuroma and you're barefoot, it is not a neuroma, okay? Intermetatarsal neuromas are irritation of the nerve between your metatarsals. It's commonly between your third and fourth toes, and that's because lateral column is to four and five, and 
metatarsals one, two, and three are medial. And th that's where we tend to have more motion. And that's when people get intermetatarsal neuromas. There are very few true neuromas out there. So when it's coming on, you're not doing a good job of preventing, right? Right, but the, right, so know that an accumulation of pressure and accumulation of steps will start to induce those symptoms. That is not neuroma, typically. Um, classic neuroma symptoms are, yes, your toes can go numb, um, taking off your shoe is helpful, you should not have any pain when you're barefoot, right? So if you have pain when you're barefoot, you do not have a neuroma. Don't let anyone take those nerves out because they're there for a reason. We are born with them. We want them. Don't take them out if you don't need to take them out, right? So make sure it's, it's truly an aroma before someone says, now yeah, let's rip those guys out. Well, of course it's going to get better. You just lost the nerves there. You won't feel it anymore, <laughs> which I guess could be the answer for some people, but no one's doing that to my foot. So I choose to not do it to your foot also. It is, right? So what are shin splints? Shin splints are either your tibialis anterior or your tibialis posterior working harder to stabilize your foot. So tibialis anterior is the muscle that will lift your foot up so that you can walk and not drag your toes, right? So when someone has foot drop, tibialis anterior is not working. Oh, sorry. Um, tibialis posterior needs to be intact in order to make your foot stable for you to be able to push off. If, if it doesn't work, you cannot walk. You definitely cannot stand on your tiptoes. So shin splints are those muscles overworking to help stabilize your foot and it manifests not as at the tendon or at the joints, but at the attachment of that muscle on your leg. That's what those are. So that's usually support also or you have a training issue. <laughs> Meaning, yes, you have all your support, but you maybe did too much too soon. So sometimes it's training induced too. I find that I usually get them when I change the surface of the walking shoe and vice versa. So you might walk different on the, that terrain, right? So training, that's a training problem, right? So you might want to wear different shoes when you walk in the mall versus when you walk on the trail. Just depends, yeah. Oh, toe, toe pads? Uh, oh, your toes cramp, right? So that's that flexor stabilization. These are tiny muscles, and they're not meant to stabilize your feet. So that's why people get cramps. Right? And that's why most of the time when someone gets a cramp in their toe, it's, it's down. Rarely do you get one where it's up. But those happen too. It just depends. Some people have what's called extensor stable or substitution. They need the toe extensors to dorsiflex their foot to swing. And they will get cramps in that up direction. But for the majority of people, it's usually that down direction. Is this, a chin, is this what's called a shin sprint in this area? Just depends, maybe. <laughs> and that's anterior, right? So when I was walking this morning, that afternoon, I remember that I was getting pain in my. Well, so that's your ant tibialis anterior, it's working too hard, right? So you go, well, why is it working too hard? I don't know, right? You have to look and see why is it working so hard, right? So is it because your calf muscles are too tight and it's fighting that to lift your foot to clear the ground? Right, so it's mechanics. A lot of the stuff ends up being mechanics. Yeah. So for stress fractures, we're not passing anything like that. Depends. Right, so say you are, have a stress fracture, right? Stress fractures are not true fractures of your bones. It's inflammation around a bone, and it's typically a long bone, usually a metatarsal. So it's pressure. Um, so if you've never had any kind of support, you might be average, kind of, right?
put something, try something, right? And if that something's not working, you're not average, right? You didn't fit the mold, right? And if you don't want to spend the money to experiment, that's when you go and see someone for guidance, right? So just be aware there are, there are really good stores that will market really heavily and um, just be careful. Just preformed orthotics in my office are $95. Prescription orthotics in my office are 425. You go to Good Feet, you're gonna spend a thousand dollars for three pairs of over-the-counter orthotics. Oh god. Wow, they increase their fees, right? So why don't you try super feet for 50? Right? Because it's average. And I brought one of those, um, one of the types of those orthotics. They're pretty minimal. They don't have much to them. Um but they don't have much to them because they don't want to give you too much stuff that you can complain about that would maybe hurt you from the device. So they would rather err on not hurting you with the device than actually, you know, offering support. So go get something cheaper that's going to work, right? So a heel cup in a device is this thing, and that helps. That gives you some support. This is, doesn't have any. This is what I add to my dress shoes when I'm like, now I'm gonna to be tortured at a wedding and I have to stand and I just need something. I'll put something like this in, but it's not enough usually for me for anything else. So, so if you, there are, so I did go out to see, so, um, all right, traditional super feet, and we'll use this one as an example. The color on the top matches the color on the bottom, right? Blue and blue, green and green, pink and pink, copper and copper. There is a newer version, that carbon one, it's $5 more. I looked at it, it has correction on the outside of the midfoot. So it gives you more than just this regular one. So if you think, oh, I don't think I'm very over the counter, or very average, but you still wanted to try something over the counter, you might want to get the carbon version of the super feet, okay? Um, if you have that higher arch foot, I'll touch on that Cinderella foot, right? There, are, there aren't very many orthotics that will help you. However, there are some shoes that will help you. It's kind of weird. Chaco river sandals have midfoot support on the medial aspect and on the lateral aspect of that shoe. So the cloud version, which is very light and squishy, right? It's light and squishy. Remember, light and squishy isn't good. <laughs> Don't get the light and squishy, but the, the traditional one is rigid. Um, those have more support in that shoe, that sandal. Not so much in the shoes, but in the sandals. So you could always try things like that, right? So if you are someone who doesn't wear an orthotic, but you like your chacos in the summer, you have that foot that needs stuff on the outside. And so, you can try those super feet that are carbon if that's not enough. If you have to come see me, bring me what you have because sometimes you have a device that I can modify and I usually, probably because I'm frugal, I always just want to work with what you have first and, and explain what they do for you and then we move you on from there if I really just don't think it's going to match your foot shape or your activity level, okay? So, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a mishmash of what insurances cover. There's, um, most Medicares will not cover orthotics, okay? So Medicare is if you're 65 or older. Um, however, Select Health Medicare Advantage covers orthotics, which is, like, awesome. Um, <laughs> that's the only one I can think of that's Medicare. Um, I don't know. So my office is pretty good about helping you navigate that so if you wanted to know you could give them your insurance and that they would help you right so but not always and a lot of times I still even if your insurance covers orthotics and you will fit into the mold of a preformed orthotic in my office that I can modify I sometimes will still push you that direction so it just you know we it's a conversation usually that we have yeah mm -hmm. Right. 
right? So remember, this is what's going to move, the middle, right? Ankle is this range of motion. Your subtalar joint is what we call inversion, eversion. This is all wired so you can't see it. When you step down on the ground, you will have pressure at your forefoot until that middle gets stable. So if you're getting pressure, it almost directly correlates. Some I have some people are like, ah, my fourth metatarsal heads, right? The outside piggy get sore. I, I mean, I look at the foot, but I, I already know it's the lateral midfoot that needs something because this is going to get pressure until that gets stable. Okay, so. Same with the medial side. Three is the hard one, right? They're like, it's under three. I'm like, ah, okay, now I gotta, you know, do a little bit more to figure out is it medial or is it lateral? Sometimes it's a combination. So, I have to give you something to stabilize your midfoot and your rear foot to take pressure off your forefoot. Uh, there's no other way other than I can put you in an accommodative and tell you not to move very much, or I have to do this with shoes. Okay, so shoes can matter. Remember again, shoes can matter. So there are things called um, orthopedic shoes, which sounds horrible, but uh, an orthopedic shoe means, oh, uh, let's see, none of these are orthopedic. It just means, I'll just use this boot. An orthopedic shoe means there is an elevation of the heel. Actually, these aren't bad. It's stiff through the middle. So can you see that the toe is scooped and up like a rocking chair? It's a rigid rocker bottom shoe. So you actually get some forefoot pressure relief with this shoe because you teeter-totter and you propel through your shoe. People who do a lot of stand and walk, um, nurses, right? They're going to walk and then they got to stand, right? And then walk and then they're going to stand. Rigid rocker bottom shoes, orthopedic shoes are very helpful for them. Right, so elevating the heel kind of takes some pressure off their back. There's relative relaxation, posterior muscle groups, and then they can kind of propel through. There's a synergistic benefit when they put that orthotic with it. Okay, so, right, for you, if you're like, ah, my heel hurts, my forefoot hurts, right? You know, you never know what compliments you'll get. <laughs> So there are some brands that will work with orthotics that are rigid rocker bottom shoes. New Balance makes a walking shoe that's a rigid rocker bottom and it comes in widths if you're a guy, right? Girls are not gonna wanna wear those. Um, Allegria is a brand, Dillard's carries them. They have some that are rigid rocker bottoms. They have a big thick inner sole, but those will work with orthotics. Stance goes, the professional clogs won't, but some of their others will. So there's, there are some, there are more out there, All right? So Allegria makes boys shoes, men's shoes, and they're cute. They are, they'll match your outfit, yeah. So, okay, anything else? Yeah. It's probably not a right or wrong answer, but for hiking and backpacking specifically, um, higher boots that give you ankle support versus like trail runners. That's gonna be preference. Right, preference. Um, I kind of decide, I have both, right? So when I decide what shoes am I going to bring, because I am not going to bring two pairs, right? I'm going to bring one pair and then a sandal to walk in once I get to camp. It kind of depends on the terrain I'm walking in, okay? So for example, that Bighorn Crags trip, those Idaho Trails Association might have been there because those trails were fantastic. There was not a tree down on them. They were perfect. Yeah, well, they were awesome, right? And um, I just wore my trail running shoes. Right? I didn't need to go through any, you know, um, scree or anything like that. When I hiked up Bora, I did wear hiking boots, right? Because that scree is awful. <laughs> Either you can't get a foothold when you come back down from the top of that. And so I did wear a high top then. It just kind of depends on your preference. Um, go with what's comfortable, right? And now there's uppers that are waterproof. There's uh, there are uppers that are breathable. Which one do you take? 
Well, I don't know, if your feet get really hot and sweaty, you probably want the breathable ones, but I don't know that, right? I mean, it just depends. Um, oh, and then do you take your socks off halfway through if you want, right? If you want them to air out, yes. Do I? No. Um, but you can. And, um, sock liners, it depends, right? If you have really sweaty, sweaty feet, sometimes it's nice to switch, right? Or wear something special. Don't put powders in if you have really sweaty feet because it turns to mud. And then it's more friction. And then it's more blisters, yeah. It, they can, right? It depends. It's the same thing as if you double sock, right? So I have some people who have really, really sweaty feet and moleskin just will not stick. And duct tape will not stick. So they'll, they'll double up or a sock liner, right? So it just depends. But do the homework before you go on your trip, right? Don't do it on your trip. Yeah. Do yeah. bamboo socks work really well? You know, I don't know how much those wick. I don't know the answer to that, but they're nice and soft. Yes. <laughs> they sure feel good. So they could be your camp socks, yeah. right? So yeah, I don't know the answer. I mean, you would probably have to wear them and see how sweaty were your feet, right? After you wore them, yeah. So. Okay, are we? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any other questions? Awesome, okay. A lot of blah. <laughs> oh, so let's see. Oh, yeah. This is what I pack. I mostly pack band aids for other people. I bring duct tape for other people. All of that is for other people, actually. <laughs> you don't need a special needle and you don't need anything like super sterile. Your feet are really pretty dirty, just in case you didn't know that. <laughs> okay. okay, and then what else did I have in there? Oh, that's Walter. I caught the biggest fish. So that's at uh, Wilson, no, Harbor Lake. Um, so we already got questions, and I think I'm done. So if you need me, there's my phone number. Um, happy to answer questions, right? So. Okay. I didn't bring cards. You'll have to just take a picture of it. We'll try to go green. Okay. <laughs>